Everyone's talking about drafting that new hotshot rookie for the Minnesota Vikings, but like, are these dudes even good? Welcome to the Lockdown Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to those of you who listen every single day. My hashtag everydayers. Love you all very much. I love hearing from you, and I hear from you plenty on Tuesdays because it is Twitter Tuesdays. I'm answering your questions here on the show. If you are new here, you can always find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening place like Sirius XM, partnered with them. Obviously love that. Uh, you can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If you if your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So it's Twitter Tuesday. That means I'm answering your questions. If you want to send them to me, you can send them to me whenever you want on Twitter at LukeBrownNFL or at LockedOnVikings on Twitter. You can also uh, fill out a Google form in the show notes or send me an email at LockedOnVikingsPodcast at gmail.com. First one I am answering today comes from AJ, who asks, how would you compare this year's QB class to last year's QB class. So obviously that's like a huge question and and talking about each one of these guys is going to be, they're each going to at least get their own show, right? Uh, and, and I'm excited to do those. But generally, I think I've gone through the top end guys at least. Like I don't I don't think JJ McCarthy is going to, or Bo Nix is going to, because those are the two guys I haven't watched yet. But it doesn't sound like they're going to come like upend this take. Uh, I don't think anybody in this class would go higher than fourth if they were coming out last year uh, or if they were part of last year's class. Um, I would, I didn't really watch Bryce young last year because by the time I got to the QBs, it was already so locked into the first overall pick. It was kind of a waste of time. Like I'm not covering the Panthers, um, but watching at least Stroud and understanding the narrative around young was that he was just about as good as Stroud. I, I watched Stroud. I loved, loved, loved Stroud. Uh, loved, loved, loved Anthony Richardson. It was meh on Will Levis. I think Will Levis, probably would go back. It, it would be in like, like I'm in a Penix place with him. Like I, I feel like those guys are in the same tier for me, like the kind of high second round kind of guy. Um, but looking at like Caleb Williams, Drake may Jaden Daniels, if I could have CJ Stroud or a, a Anthony Richardson over those guys, just based off of what I, what I felt about them coming out. Yeah. I'm slamming the 2023 guys over the 2024 guys. Absolutely. Um, that said, that doesn't mean that I don't, like these these other quarterbacks or anything like that. And one thing you're going to find, and, and I think some of you might even get frustrated with me over it, but I'm going to be stubborn, uh, is that I'm not going to like try to, I'm going to try not to rank them very much. I'm not going to say this is my QB1, my 2, my 3, my 4, my 5, because I think that just naturally discourages nuanced thought. It just like gives people a really great excuse to not think any deeper about these guys. And honestly, like if we are going to try to compare like Caleb Williams to, to Jaden Daniels, and if you've looked into these guys at all, way different play styles, even though they're both very much run around quarterbacks, they, they both use their legs a lot. They both scramble a lot. Jaden Daniels scrambles to run. Caleb Williams scrambles to throw. Both of them have all kinds of explosive potential off of that. It's just totally different styles and saying, well, I like one over the other is probably going to be more of a matter of like my preference for, for certain traits than it is, um, an actual like prediction for who is going to be a better quarterback in the NFL, which by the way, my prediction for who is going to be a better quarterback in the NFL should not mean anything to you. Nobody's should. Nobody can predict this. That's why we're looking at Bryce Young going, how did he go first overall over CJ Stroud? Even just a year in, I mean, that seemed like an unconscionable uh, idea for Bryce Young to be that much worse than, like there was debate over which one of those guys should go first overall. Uh, but for the difference to be this stark, I think was a surprise to pretty much everybody. So yeah, I, I don't, 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 don't take it too seriously. All right. And that my rank, you shouldn't need my rankings. If you want to listen to what I have to say about a quarterback, then listen to the, the like substance of what I have to say about a quarterback. If I just slap an 8.5 on it, 
it's going to make you feel like you flip to the back of the book to get the answer, you know, and uh, I, I don't want to encourage that. Uh, Eric Dered says, if Quasi was taking notes while he's, he was watching that game unfold, talking about the NFC Championship, how there are, by the way, ton of Lions questions today. Uh, I'm glad to see that you all uh, dealt with that in a nice, mature and healthy way. <laughs> it's a lot of people want to talk about the Lions. So we'll, we'll answer. Uh, so if Quasi was taking notes as he was watching their game unfold on how to beat the Lions, what would those notes look like? Um that is such a fascinating question, and and I, I have not, I will not delve deep enough into the NFC Championship. I, go listen to Locked On 49ers or Locked On Lions if you really want to hear about that game in more depth, and I'll go into it. Um, but just on like the cursory watch and the sort of top of head memory, um, physicality, because honestly, what scared me about the Lions all season long was. Frank Ragnow and Penny Sewell and like Taylor Decker, like these guys that that were just denting dudes all year long. Ragnow in particular, best center in the league. So I think it's it's beef up front. And that's what you're looking for. Oh my God, we got to beat the Lions. It's beef up front. That said, Christmas Eve was a close game with a backup quarterback. So I'm not sure if they're looking at that and saying, man, we've got to totally change our complexion of the team so that we can beat this spooky Lions team. I think there's only really one team in the league that has that effect on their division rivals, and that's Kansas City. I don't think anybody else has, gets to have that effect on, the, on, their, uh, on their rivals. Manders says, do you think the Lions' loss will have an impact on their season next year? I mean, most teams don't tend to repeat getting that far into the playoffs. Um, I don't know if, if that's necessarily a dependent variable. Like, yeah, it's just hard to do the thing twice in a row. It's hard to do the thing once, especially hard to do it twice in a row. Uh, I actually looked at it, and in the NFC... It's harder in the AFC because the AFC kind of was all repeat winners because it was like the Patriots and Chiefs every year and Peyton Manning. Uh, but since realignment, there have been 22 seasons, which means there have been 88 division winners. Uh, and of those 88 division winners, 64 of them were new, were, were not repeat winners, were, the, were different from the guy, the team last year. So yeah, it's really hard to do. Uh, that said, I, I don't think that their loss in particular is going to do anything one way or another. It's just that they have to pull it together again. They're going to have turnover. Guys are going to change. You know, coaching staff is probably going to leave, uh, you know, to, to better jobs and, you know, promotions and stuff. That's that's what you get when you're good. Uh, and then they're going to have to try to find a way to recapture that same magic with a different group of people, new group of rookies, new group of free agents. You know, guys are a year older. Guys are a year more expensive. That's the challenge of the NFL. Uh, and, really, unless you are like specifically Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady, like even Peyton Manning wasn't always like he, even he had a blip, right? Uh, unless you're literally one of those two guys, you don't get to just like have enjoy sustained success. It is always a year to year proposition. Everybody starts zero and zero and every single game starts scoreless. You got to go do it still. Uh, Chris says, how do you think this Lions loss compares to 38-7 coming off the Minneapolis miracle? Uh, God, so much worse. So, <laughs> that, like, I don't know. My thing was, I, I was just starting to write in 2017. Um, I wasn't even doing it for, like, I wasn't even getting paid. I was just, like, kind of doing it as a hobby when I got home from work. And I wrote a ranking of the NFC Championship losses, uh, of which there have been six, that and like like a pain ranking um and you know at the bottom you get like the the cowboys one from the 70s and or i think it was it was 77 that was like they were not gonna go anywhere anyways and i think 38 to 7 was fifth of the six because otherwise you get like the Darren Nelson Washington one that felt like such a magical season and it was such a heartbreaker. You get, of course, um, 41 donut like that one is just so such a legacy. And it's like a, if, if you're going to put a blowout like that, that's a worse blowout like that was above it. And then, of course, 98 and 2009, I, like I, I think Lions fans ex experienced their 98 or their 2009 here. This is going to be the game that they blew a 17 point lead or the game that they gave up 27 unanswered. However, you know, people talk about it in a year. And it's going to be one of those like formative things that is like a, a trauma that will like exist every time the, the Lions go to San Francisco. They have a road game in San Francisco next year, and it's going to be like hard for them to get through. I know I've done this like 
the uh, the the week one game after 2009, 2010, the season opener was Vikings at Saints. Uh, and that game was impossible to watch. Like that game was like the, the lead up to it, this idea of revenge. And then the Vikings lost it. And like that, like that, the wound was still so fresh and it was so visceral that like the emotional blow of that is still like fresh in my memory, as fresh as any regular season game, like 13 years later. Uh, and the lions are going to have to like deal with that when they go play San Francisco this year, which could be the season opener, like absolutely could be the season opener, especially if the Niners win the Super Bowl. Uh, well, I guess it has to be right. Cause it has to be the Super Bowl winner, but like that's 38 to seven was not even the worst NFC championship blowout to an NFC East team that the Vikings have suffered. Like it was, that's fine. <laughs> it does not bother me at all. Sports guy 709 says the Lions won too many games and completely wrecked their draft position. How do they move forward from such a mistake? Yeah, I don't know, man. I guess they have to tank. Uh, <laughs> I've got more serious questions uh, coming up here on Twitter Tuesday, so we're going to keep it rolling. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by FanDuel, and it is getting to be that time of year. Super Bowl props are up over at FanDuel, so go check them out. FanDuel.com slash locked on if you haven't signed up yet, and you will get $200 in bonus bets if you first bet $5 or more wins. So go place a $5 bet on you some heavy favorite in the NBA. Who cares, right? But if you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and you win that $5 or more bet, you can get $200 back in bonus bets. Uh, Super Bowl props are very, very fun. All kinds of wacky stuff. Like, will there be a hundred, hundred yard rusher? Uh, there's one that's like, uh, Debo Samuel will get a 30 yard rush because I, I guess like that happened in the, in the last time, the 2019 one with the 49ers and the chiefs. So all kinds of fun stuff you can go find over there. Once again, that is FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Moving onward with this episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, don't lift a finger. When this thing is done, watch all the way to the end, watch through it. It'll take you right to the Locked On Minnesota Sports YouTube page and their 24-7 Locked On Minnesota live stream. So Minnesota Sports Talk. I know the Twins just made a trade. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about with the Wolves. Uh, tons of stuff going on in Minnesota sports. Keep yourself up to date with daily coverage of all things Locked On Minnesota Sports, including this show. You can find it over there. Uh, let's keep going here with these questions on the Locked On Vikings podcast. We're done with Lions questions, all right? That's that's all the Lions questions I'm going to take. Next one comes from Landon Miller, who says, how much of an impact did Josh Oliver actually make on the run game? I feel like it was kind of hyped that the run game would be fixed before the season, but it fell apart. Um, yeah, so the run game was still not good, right? But Josh Oliver himself was very good. But a run game is is an, an amalgamation of, of everyone, right? I mean, there's there's seven, eight players on any given run play that all have a job and all have an impact. So expecting one person to come in and like be the guy that makes you good at the run game probably wasn't the right expectation. Um, that said, did he have a positive impact? Oh, 100%. Absolutely, he helped. Uh, and I mean, he did all kinds of really great run plays where you look and you see 84 blocking the absolute heck out of somebody. He was very good. I'm very excited to see him as a blocking tight end, but he's still, he's a blocking tight end. Uh, and the issues in the Vikings run game were not in the blocking of the tight ends at all. Hawkinson was, was pretty good at least too. It was in, I think like bad reads by running backs. And, and then I think sometimes they just got out physical because they are not like Garrett Bradbury's like not built to be like this guy. <laughs> This is like physical bruiser, right? He ain't no Frank Rag Ragnar, that's for sure. Um, Ryan says, is cornerback actually as great a need as people say? We have cornerback one and cornerback two and a question mark for cornerback three. Not a bad situation at all. Yeah, so if you listen to Friday's Locked On episode, I went into this in depth. I, I spent the whole episode basically on that question, um, including free agents and what they'll cost and how to make that work on the cap and all that stuff. So go check that out. Um, but yeah, I kind of found like, after I thought about it for a little bit, I was like, yeah, I, like they don't need to get four bodies this time. Like they have some young guys that they feel like have stepped up. Right. I think a Caleb Evans at the very least can continue to, to compete for a starting job, make him win it this year. I've, I've got no issue with that. Um, you know, happy with Byron Murphy, really happy with Byron Murphy. He had, a, I think he had a really good season. 
Andrew Booth, I thought, took a step forward. You know, Makai Blackman going into his second year. Like, yeah, you got some, like, young pieces. I, I just want to inject a little more competition. So I wanted to, like, bring in, like, one guy and then just, like, let it shake out in camp. That's kind of where I'm at on cornerback. But that's not the most dire need, you know? Give me, like, one second-round pick or one, like, you know, mid-sized free agent. Uh, you know, you don't need to go out and get the luxurious need. That would be great. But you, I don't think you need to splurge that hard. Josh asks, which free agent running back would you rather have and why? Can we afford DeAndre Swift and extend and re-sign all our players we need? So I don't know if DeAndre Swift will actually be all that expensive, and running backs in general just aren't going to be that expensive. The the that market has completely crashed, and running backs are, are pretty cheap to even even go get like the top of market one isn't going to cost all that much. So yeah, I think I mean they can definitely afford it. And in fact, as proof of concept, in that Friday episode, this this last Friday, the one about cornerbacks. I actually just to just to see if I could decided what if they also signed Saquon Barkley for eleven million dollars on one year? Can they still make all the cap stuff work that we got to talk about? The answer was yes, and I didn't even have to work very hard. In fact, I, I worked harder to like make it specifically difficult than I did to actually like solve the problem that I had created. So I did it like really irresponsible contracts, and it still worked out fine. So yeah, uh, you could definitely afford. DeAndre Swift and, and extend everybody. Um, I've, I've been talking at length on Lockdown Vikings. If you're new here, you can go find some old episodes. It'll come up again too. Don't worry. Um, but the extension stuff that they have to do, Hunter and Justin Jefferson and all that stuff, because of the way that cap hits are already structured and weird void year shenanigans, there's like no cap constraint on it. Like they've kind of already paid what they have to pay in a way to make that stuff work so they can press all of those buttons and still have a really, really active free agency. In fact, if they don't have an active free agency, I, I think it's a huge punt. Um, Get Quacken says, does the Flores psycho scheme continue to work after getting solved if we replace our awful pass rush with a good pass rush? I mean, you're never going to go wrong with a good pass rush, right? Like making the pass rush better makes just about anything work on the back end, right? Get a little bit of pressure and those guys don't have to hold up as much and you don't have to manufacture as much and you don't have to be quite as limited schematically. You can just sit and cover one uh, if you can get a bunch of pressure, right? Uh, or sit back in zones. Um, so yeah, that would very much help, but I do think that it won't, it's not a panacea. Like it, you have to still, I think, make some schematic adjustments so that you don't just like die to, uh, you know, double flat, which was a way that like the Flores thing got solved. The way that those blitz rules work, you'll often have like a D tackle going into coverage and, and which side that D tackle is on is the side that the protection slides to. So you slide the protection toward Harrison Phillips. You put a running back over there, you send him out to the flat and now Harrison Phillips has to chase a running back out to the flat. First down <laughs> every time. I mean, the Bengals spammed it. The Lions spammed it. The Packers spammed it in like three games in a row. It was it was nasty. So you've got to find a solution to that. I'm not smart enough to know it, but I I, I see the same play getting them over and over again. It's at least worth pointing out. Uh, Casey the Coolest asks, if Harrison Smith retires or is a cap casualty, what does that do for the state of the safety room given the lack of production for Lewis Seen? For me, the first answer to that is it is an opportunity for Lewis Seen, right? Now, here's the deal. He got usurped by Theo Jackson. Theo Jackson is a pending exclusive rights free agent, so he'll almost certainly be back. Exclusive rights free agents don't really have, they don't have any negotiation power. All you do is you click a button, you get him back on like a minimum deal um, or a minimum sized deal, I guess. So he'll almost certainly be back. It's free to do so. And they were pretty happy with him. So beat Theo Jackson in camp and you can do it. But I think for safety three, if you're going to call, you know, Metellus and Bynum safeties one and two, uh, then you have seen and Theo Jackson competing for safety three. It's another one where like, yeah, I could put a day three guy in there just to compete and just to like make that competition a little stiffer. But I don't think it is a need. If that's what you're getting at, like, I don't think acquiring a safety would be important. I think that they, because Bynum and Metellus kind of emerged the way that they did, and because we're keeping Brian Flores, so we know we can kind of give them the same assignments um, and, and hopefully find some sustainability in that, like, you don't need to go crazy for a safety, right? Like, you, you're good at safety, and maybe you just want to add a little bit of depth, which is kind of never a bad idea. Um, I've got a few more questions. 
but I want to make sure that I get to the silliest ones. So we're going to keep on rolling here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by eBay Motors. eBay Motors is there to help you out with your car because your car is two things. One, it is an essential part of your life, probably if you have one. Uh, and two, it is an extension of who you are. It's a way that you express yourself, you, the, the, the color of your car, the design of, you, of the interior, the way that you keep it. That's all kind of part of who you are. eBay Motors understands this. With over 122 million parts for your car, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for, whether it is something cosmetic, like a, a cool LED or something like that, uh, or something that you actually need under the hood. They will make sure that that thing fits your car. There's all kinds of makes and models and different parts that fit different kind of ways. And if it was made from this factory or whatever, they'll navigate all of that for you and get you something that is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. With the parts you need at the prices you want, it is easy to get that thing going exactly the way that you want it. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Moving right along with this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. The next one comes from Patrick Nissler, who asks, is it true that the Vikings fired their scouting department after Quasey's first year? Um, so my understanding, I'm going off the dome here. This was all reported, though, so you can look it all up uh, and check me on this. But my understanding is that they, it was like some of the, most of the scouts. They, they did retain a few. But they did kind of, I think they, they, uh, it's probably safe to say that they reevaluated all their scouts and some of them they decided to keep. Um, but yeah, they did a lot of that and then brought in a lot of their own guys, which is pretty normal when a new GM comes in because Quasi gets hired is like February, right? Or January. And then the draft is like four months from then. So firing the scouting, like bringing in all of your own st scouting staff instead of just dealing with the staff that you inherited is fairly standard practice in the NFL, which is pretty wild when you compare it to other industries. But hey, the NFL is a little different. Um, but to do that and then say, OK, scout a whole draft in four months would basically be impossible. So it's not really feasible to get right in and then like get rid of all the scouts. So you basically pop in, you catch up on what the scouts have, have told you, you do that draft. And then for the next year, for scouting departments in particular, the draft is kind of their Super Bowl, right? That's like where the year sort of ends. And then you decide, you know, who's who's staying and moving on and whatever. Um, so then after that, he reevaluates, he brings in a whole bunch of your own guys. And, and he also said, like, does that possibly explain why the 2022 class was so much worse than the 2023 class? And it could, but I don't think you need that sort of exp like the draft just does that. <laughs> you just whiff sometimes and you do great sometimes. And that's just kind of how it goes. Um, Minnesota Sports Appreciator said, uh, cited a stat. So he, he quoted something from a, a Twitter account called Vikings Fan Page who said 137 tackles, which was the most by a Viking safety since 1985. And Minnesota Sports Appreciator about this asked, is this a Flores thing or is Bynum just that great? Um, so the, the answer to this is the more I, I try to learn, uh, especially about defense, the more this answer is always both. And I, this this comes up a lot in Twitter Tuesdays. There's a lot of versions of, you know, so and so here's this phenomenon. Is it is it the fault of the scheme or the fault of the player or credit to the scheme or credit to the player? Uh, it is just kind of always both. Look, schemes only work on the whiteboard. The player has to go do it right. And there's things that Kyle Bynum did a great job of executing kind of fell apart at the end of the year. But so did everybody coming down from depth and tackling and being aggressive about that and correct about that is like kind of what they drafted Lewis seemed to be and Bynum's just doing it instead, which is great for him. So he did really well, but also I think Flores did a great job of putting Cam Bynum in a position to do things he is good at and execute them well. He was very well taught. Like you can credit both guys for this. Absolutely. The next one comes from Joe Talent, who says, uh, so he did a weight comparison from left tackle to right tackle between the Vikings and the Lions. And he, I'm not checking any of this, Joe, so I hope you were right. Uh, left tackle, exact same left guard, 18, they are 18 pounds heavier, five pounds heavier at center, 32 pounds heavier at right guard and 10 pounds heavier at right tackle. So heavier at four of the five positions, the lions are than the Vikings. Uh, 
does every pound matter? And is 10 a lot of difference? So heavier isn't always going to be better with offensive line. You're talking like extreme generalities here. So one thing the Lions do that the Vikings don't is they run a lot more gap scheme. Vikings do a little bit of gap scheme. They do it as sort of a counterpunch to their zone stuff, but they are primarily a zone scheme. The Lions run a ton of gap scheme and their counterpunches are more gap scheme. So what I mean by gap scheme is usually stuff with pullers, um, a lot of down blocking and, and pulling. Uh, so that means a lot more just firing off and pushing. Um, a down block goes against the grain of the run. So if the run is to the left, a down block is to the right. So where is that defensive tackle going to try to go right from the offense's perspective? He's going to chase the running back who's going to the left. So you're blocking the guy that's coming straight at you right? You're not chasing anybody, but you're meeting him. You got to be big and powerful for that. So gap schemes require bigger linemen. Whereas zone schemes, you're chasing a guy down. If it is zoned to the left, you're blocking the guy to your left. And he's also trying to go to your left and he's got a head start on you because he's already lined up to your left. So you need to be a little bit lighter and a little bit more nimble. That's the difference in, in build here. And the Vikings line was very much built to be like a true blue zone line from the Kubiak days from before O'Connell even got here, but he also does zone stuff. So, you know, a lot of that works out. Um, so it's it, it, heavier is not necessarily better, but I would even stray away from poundage at all. Weight itself is going to kind of mislead you a lot because you don't really care about heavy. You care about strong. So who's stronger? And if you want to measure that, I would say look at the jumps in the combine um, bench press a little bit, but not really. It's mostly the jumps like the explosion, the broad jump and the vertical jump are going to tell you a lot about that as well as um, like the 10 split of the 40 yard dash, I think are the ones for offensive line, if, if I'm not mistaken. Those are the things that will really tell you like what the um, the, the true athletes are. But yeah, if, if we have a, a, a right tackle that's 10 pounds lighter than their right tackle, that just that might just work for both of us. That might just be like a difference in preference and a difference in style. Kiefer asks, uh, I have a question about our team's actual biggest need. Who is going to be kicking field goals for us this season? I hear Mason Crosby is available. Kiefer, I will find you. Kiefer, I, 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 look me dead in the eye, all right? If you're watching, look me dead in the eye. I will find you. Malcolm Biggles asks, Addison and Pace were both rookies with... I should probably answer that question. Okay, I'm sorry, Kiefer. Uh, the... I don't know. <laughs> I hope it's not Greg Joseph. He's a pending free agent. It certainly doesn't have to be Greg Joseph. He's been a bottom five kicker for three years running. I don't really get their obsession with him. He misses a lot of field goals and extra points. It's like, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's pretty consistently bad. Uh, Malcolm Biggles says Addison and Pace were both rookies with great years, but you can tell their usage is still limited because of their size. Is this something that can be fixed with experience or technique? Uh, no, not really. You can't make a guy grow, right? That's why you, that's why guys with, you know, big frames and big traits always go higher because you can't teach that, right? Um, there are things, I talked about it with Addison at length yesterday on, on this show. There are things that he can do to get around guys with his size, but it's always just going to be a hard mode that he plays on. And same with, with Ivan Pace. It means he has to be a block evader, right? He is not going to be a stack and shed and hold the point against a double kind of linebacker. It's never going to be who he is. And it's not who you should try to make him into, right? Uh, but that does mean that, yeah, you're going to have to sort of approach things in a different way. It's going to limit your options and your flexibility. And that's just that's something that the Vikings willingly got into because the other traits that those guys have are worth it, right? Ivan Pace started because he's good at playing that style of linebacker. So it's worth it to deal with his size. And it's definitely the same with Jordan Addison getting picked in the first round. Um, that's, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it works. It's, it's fine. Uh, Jish Fish asks, how are NFL scouting departments organized? Do certain scouts have certain regions of the country they focus on? Is it split by position where you have QB scout, DB scout, etc.? cetera? Um, so it is regional the way I understand it. And I don't think it's positional. I think you, you get have a scout and that guy is like responsible for the, for the Northeast and they go to all of the Northeast schools and they travel around, and, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, and they go to the Maryland and they go to everywhere over on that region. And I, it's, it's a logistical thing, right? It's like about travel budgets more than it is about like having someone super focused on this. Uh, so usually it's like regional scouts. And then that like that's your sort of rank and file. 
And then you'll have kind of like director of area scouting and you might even divide that up regionally if you have a big staff. Then it goes up to like director of player personnel and GM and all and the guys that are like the real decision makers there. But the guys actually going to, guys and gals, going to uh, the the actual games and, and meeting with people and, you know, actually traveling around and doing the legwork is divided regionally. I would, I'll say usually, I'm, I'm sure there's scouting departments in the history of the league that work differently. The Mad says, what is your favorite recipe for beans? I am the bean guy. So, uh, I must, I must answer this. Okay. So for one, ever since I did the bean video, which started this meme, which you can find on patreon.com slash NFL if you want to learn more about the salary cap. I did some bean counting. And I bought the beans for props for that video. And then I was like, well, now I got a bunch of beans. I should learn how to cook beans, <laughs> like dry beans, uh, which is not very hard. And then I realized that they're like incredibly good for you. Also, like there's, you know, great nutrition to them. Calorie wise, they're not so bad, especially for uh, how substantive they are chock full of protein, all sorts of great reasons to eat a lot of beans. Just leach them right and you'll be less gassy. That's that's the deal there. So cooking from dry beans is great. Um, I think the best move the, or the move I've been really into lately is like soups. So, you know, make a, a good stock and don't don't like buy the, the grocery store stock like use that and but add like flavor to it. Uh, I'm very much a fan of better than bouillon. The the you can find at the grocery store or bouillon cubes if you if you if that's what you have is fine, I guess. Uh, you know, put some vegetables in there, some celery, celery, some onions, some garlic, some carrots. Just throw it in, right? Just like haphazard. Don't work too hard. And then when you have a broth that you feel is tasty and that you would like, oh man, like I would enjoy spoonfuls on spoonfuls on spoonfuls of this broth. Then leach some beans, which it's just put them in like hot water, not not boiling water, but like get water to a boil and then turn the heat off, put beans into hot water and cover it for a couple hours. That leaches out a lot of the stuff that's that hurts your digestion. And then they'll double in size, put those doubled beans, drain them, rinse them, put them into the broth and then cook them until they are as tender as you want them. I like them with a little bite to them. I don't I don't want them to be mush, but that's just me. That's what I would say for beans. And then, you know, add whatever else you want to have in your soup. Pasta, uh, that, that can be great, right? Pasta and beans together in soup. That's not a weird move at all. Meats, right? Uh, I would cook those meats separately, though, because like boiled chicken is not very good. But, you know, cook those meats separately, cut them up, add them in, whatever else you want to eat. Then it's just, that's, that's what soup is. It's food you want to eat in a good broth. What's not to like? Uh, all right, tomorrow, I don't know, maybe we'll do a quarterback, maybe we'll do another free agency thing, we'll see just where the wind takes us, but I'll see you for that, whatever it is, and as always, let's go.